Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Yes, and shout out to Brightbeam for the new intro to the show that was live. I like that. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Building the Black Educated Pipeline podcast. I am your host, Shana Terrell, educated activist hailing from the South South Bronx, but doing this great, great work in the great state of Pennsylvania in the city of Philadelphia. As always, I would like to shout out Citizens Ed, as well as the Center for Black Educated Development for giving us this platform to talk to real people in the real struggle, doing real things. And I appreciate all my co-conspirators out there watching, all the new supporters out there watching this week. We have a good show in store for you today. So today's theme is Black Male Voices and Building the Black Educator Pipeline. I'm really, really excited about the guests we have today. So today we have Rodney. Rodney has over, a t- over 20 years of experience as an educator with Richmond Public Schools. He graduated from William King, sorry, from King William High School in rural Virginia in 1996. He received a bachelor's in administration and supervision from VCU in 2000, 2011. He started teaching at Virgie Benford Education Center in 2005, a school inside Richmond Juvenile Detention Center in an effort to better understand the school to prison pipeline. His classroom is a collaborative partnership between him and his students. He provides civic center education that promotes social and emotional growth. The knowledge he's gained, he is gaining from his students is also helping him develop alternative programs to keep students from becoming a part of the prison pipeline. Don't work. His accomplishments in education vary from professional growth to his students' personal growth. He has been published four times by Yale University. He has received numerous awards for his accomplishments in and out of the classroom, most, no, most notably the REB Award for Teaching Excellence. He has worked with Posters winning author James Foreman to develop curriculum units for race, class, and punishment as a part of the Yale Teachers Institute. He was named the 2019 National Teacher of the Year by the Council of Chief State School Offices. He used his time as a Teacher of the Year to advocate for the cultural equity to make sure students have teachers and administrators who look like them and value their culture. He was recently named HBCU Male Alumnus of the Year by HBCUDigest.com. He was also named number eight on the Roots Magazine's Top 100 Influential African Americans of 2019. He was also named 2019 currently a senior advisor at Richmond Public Schools in charge of teacher and leader pathways. He has started RVA's Men Teach program to recruit and retain male teachers of color in Richmond Public Schools. He's also working with the district to implement any to implement anti-racist policies and pedagogy. His passion is helping underprivileged and underrepresented populations in America. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 2019 National Teacher of the Year, Mr. Rodney Robinson. Hey, how are you? What's up? I'm good. I'm good. I love being with Black people because Black people (laughs) pronounce that T in Rodney. You know, that's how I know where I'm at when I hear that T in Rodney. (laughs) Right. <laughs> yes, brother. Yes. Well, shout out to you for all the great work you've been doing out here uh, for kids advocating and definitely in uh, Richmond Public Schools. Like I was like getting a little winded, brother, reading that resume. Um. <laughs> <laughs> shout out to you all. You know, the, the work you're doing in the, um, building the Black Educator Pipeline is definitely, you know, hard work. And to have someone, you all to create this platform, I want to shout you all out for the good work that you're doing. Well, thank you. We appreciate you. Um, we need folks like you who we consider to be co-conspirators um, mm-hmm. around the world, working to advocate for Black children, working to advocate for Black teachers. Yeah. So we can't do this without you. Like you are a part of this pipeline. So I appreciate, appreciate, you, appreciate brother. it. Definitely. So I always like to start out by asking folks because I think it's important to hear our stories and our journey. Please talk to us about what inspired you to become a teacher. How did you get into education? Well, my journey is all about my mother. You know, my mother, she wanted to be an educator, but she never got the chance. She grew up in rural Virginia. She faced segregation. She faced poverty. And she was denied the opportunities to finish her, to even finish her high school education, much much less go to college. 
but she always believed in education. You know, she always just so my earliest memories of my mom is just her reading, her, you know, watching, doing crossword puzzles, just that constant thing to keep your mind going. And one thing she always did with me and my brothers was she always passed down that legacy of take care of the next generation. You know, and so she what she would do was even though she didn't have a degree or have all the fancy documents that says you're an educator, she started an in-home daycare in our community, taking mm. care of any kid that needed needed care. You know, she would often tell the people at church or wherever, look, just drop the kid off, bring something to eat if you got it, and pick them up <laughs> in the afternoon. And so there were days I'd wake up, there'd be two, three kids laying in the bed with me sleep, <laughs> you know, because my mom is taking in anybody that needed childcare for the day. You know, it was already five of us, so she always figured, what's 10 more kids running around the house? <laughs> <laughs> and so that, that's how I grew up. And, and, and it really was just that sense of community, taking care of each other, you know, even like things like, Hey, Rodney, ride your bike down, down the street and check on Mr. Johnson. Make sure he got wood for his stove. It's cold out tonight. Just those little lessons were always taught to me growing up, you know? And even when everybody left and went home, I learned those lessons of equity and fairness because mm. I had a sister with cerebral palsy. And my mm. mother would often say, look, I don't love your sister any less than you, but she requires more of my attention. And so just growing up in that type of environment, it really taught me those lessons of passing it on, building up the next generation and becoming what you can be. And then another reason I went to, I got into education was my K through 12 educational experience. You know, mm. growing up in rural Virginia, um, I grew up in a district, it, it was rural, but it was about 50% white, 40% black, 10% Native American, you know, now, that district is about 75 white, 20 black, and 5% Native American. And the reason you see the drop in black population is because people like myself, I'm, I'm a part of this, we went off to college and we never went back because we had a bad educational experience out there. There was no culture. There was no appreciation of being black coming mm. from the school system. You got that from you know the local community, from the churches, everything, but the school system didn't have that. And so I often said, I want to be that teacher who provides those culturally relevant experiences, that teacher who shows my kids, my students, that you're bigger than your circumstances, so that teacher who just creates opportunities for students who would never think that they could have this sort of opportunity. And so that, that's why I got into education, sort of to honor my mother and to pay it back to the next generation. Dope. And I think what's always like this so amazing about folks' stories and yours, especially about getting into education. So being a teacher for you and being an educator for you is connected to community, connected to giving back, connecting to caring and loving for one another because that's what was taught in your household, right? Like, hey, we got, it's five of us. We're going to bring 10 more. We're going to love upon each other. Okay, we're right. going to educate each other. We're going to be there for each other because that's what we're supposed to do as a community. And I think that that right there is super awesome um, in terms of your foundation that's leading you to be an educator. I think the second thing, of course, with your story is like most people, they just really had an education that just is whack. Yeah. So, <laughs> it wasn't representative of them. They didn't see themselves in the education. So you want to fight to make a change. So you definitely have all the ingredients of, of a freedom fighter, okay? <laughs> An educator activist. I love that. I definitely love that. So your current role right now, um, can you talk to us about that? Because you are leading a pretty big initiative out there in Virginia. So please, tell us about your work with RVA. Uh, yeah, um, my current role um, has changed a little bit. You know, I'm, I'm in charge of teacher and leader pathways in my school division, meaning I'm in charge of cohorts to build administrators, to build, you know, national board certified teachers, you know, student teachers, practicum students, any sort of program that grows teachers sort of falls under my wheelhouse. And so I'm really excited about this opportunity. Uh, my personal pet project is RBA Men Teach. That is a program our district in 2018 when they released their strategic plan. The, one of the goals in that plan was to re, uh, retain and recruit male teachers of color. 
And so we started our VA Men Teach. We started in the middle of a pandemic. And so it's, we, we had trouble getting our feet, feet on the ground because how can you recruit male teachers of color when you can't even leave the house? You know, so, but I, I made the number one goal is to retain last year. You know, we're, we're going to retain every male teacher of color that we have in the district. You know, like, you know, Dr. Bristol says, you know, a good recruitment, you know, retention plan is the best recruitment strategy. And so, so we just said, we're going to keep everyone here. We're going to, first thing we did, we surveyed them to see how you fit. You know, any program that doesn't start with the voice of the people that you want to make change is doomed to fail. And so I surveyed them. We had conversations about what can we do to make better? We provided grants for them to get their license, provided grants for, for professional development. We provided community, just a place where we could sit down as brothers and just chop it up, talk about the issues that we're, face, that we're facing every single day. We brought in the mayor to talk about the city, you know, just how can we help the city right now? Like Rich, Richmond, like all other major cities, we're going through some crises right now. And so we volunteered, look here, Mr. Mayor, what can we do as male teachers of color, black and brown folks, to help our black and brown populations? You know, we had conversations with um with the superintendent about what can we do to make things better. We've had conversations with colleges and universities, and it's all about creating a community where our voices and expertise are respected because that was their number one complaint. And sometimes we feel like everyone just looks past us and no one really values us other than, of course, the typical role being that disciplinarian that they want black male and brown male teachers to be. It's like, no, we're more than that. Respect our ped pedagogy, respect yeah. our expertise, because we're going to give it to you. But you brought out some really, really great points in terms of retention of black males. One, amplify their voices. Give them the room and the space to speak, to talk, to be heard, and be validated. And removing those financial barriers. How you saying, yeah, we help them get their certifications. A lot of times people don't don't look at the, those are needs sometimes um, in the African-American community for folks. Um, but biggest of all, connect, creating connections in community for folks to be in community with one another. Um, I'm not really all the way familiar with the population of Virginia um, or in terms of the demographics of the teaching setting. But if it's like anywhere else, a black man could be the sole black man in his building with no one else to be able to connect with, to be able to talk to, to share and fellowship with, um, and then breaking beyond the stereotypes. I'm glad you guys are doing that because black men are typecast, right? In roles in school, very much typecast. Oh, you big and you black, we need you to control these kids. Come yeah. on and get down with the <laughs> exactly. You know? Yeah. So man, I got a degree. <laughs> I know what I'm doing in literacy, math, and science. Put me in the classroom. Put me in front of these babies. So breaking beyond those stereotypes um, and moving beyond typecasting the black men, I think is super important. I would love to hear you too elaborate on because I, I I think people be missing this when you say the best recruitment plan <laughs> is to have a retention plan with it. I don't think people fully understand that. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? It's, it's funny, I, I saw a political cartoon, you know, maybe a couple years ago, and you know me, I'm a history teacher, so I love political cartoons, but it was just a guy in a boat, and he was, you know, bailing water out of the boat, but there was a big, gigantic hole in the bottom of the boat, and so to me, that's the teaching profession for Black males, because so many of us are leaving, are falling through that hole in the bottom of the boat, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter what else we do. If we don't plug that hole to stop people from leaving the profession, then we're ultimately we're, we're, we're not going to get anything done. And so what we have to do is we need to make sure that the teachers we have in the classroom are, number one, are they supported? Are they respected? And are we building them up? And are we burning them out? Because we know about the invisible tax. You know, that invisible tax is a monster on some of us. And the reality is, if we're not providing extra help and extra support to those teachers, they're becoming burnt out at twice the rate of white teachers, twice the rate as female teachers of color. And mm. so we really have to plug that hole to say, hey, what is, why are you leaving? We don't want you to leave. You are valued. What can we do to help you stay in a profession? And if we're not doing that, then we're just, I mean, what's the point of bringing in 10 new teachers if you've lost 15? 
Right. And so the ultimate, you're going to stay in the red with your numbers. And so it's really important that we stop yeah. people from leaving by satisfying their professional needs. What do you need? Satisfying their personal needs. What do you need? Sometimes we forget, you know, a lot of black folks, we just coming up. We're just getting an opportunity to go to college. So that college is the responsibility yes. of taking care of families, you know, not just, you know, your wife and kids, but we're talking about your brothers, mm -hmm. nieces, nephews. Sisters, and if mother, you're not yep. paying us, then wait a minute, I can't afford to be in the classroom. I remember there was a Wall Street Journal article a couple of years ago that said going into education just simply is not a wise move financially. And mm -hmm. we know that black black people take on far more student loans and come out of college and a lot more debt. So what can we do to alleviate all of those concerns so that you can focus on teaching our babies because they need someone who can teach them and can care for them without being distracted by the other burdens of life? Facts. Um, somebody asked a, a question and I think it's important to highlight on because I think a lot of times people are afraid to do some of the work you're doing because they're looking at all the challenges that are in front of them instead of really focusing on the opportunities that black men bring uh, to, to a district. So someone asked about your efforts with being able to mobilize a teacher's union um, and able to be able to implement programs for retention, especially for, for efforts of black men. Um, has the teachers union been a barrier or have they been really supportive? I know many districts where the teachers union is supportive, very supportive of those efforts. Well, the VEA, you know, you know, shout out to James Fetterman. He's a black man. He's the first black male president of the Virginia Education Association. Hey, this shout out to that brother. This is high on his priority list. And he's always been one of the advocates. He and I, we talk with legislators every day about working to get it. But the reality yeah. is Virginia is a right to work state. You know, mm -hmm. so our unions and education association, I think ours is an education association. It's not even an official union. And so yeah. they don't have as much power in our state as I've seen other teachers unions around the country. And so that gives me a lot more flexibility. Now, mm -hmm. will that last? Because they just got collective bargaining, you know, rights as, as a union that, that just passed this year. So mm -hmm. it hasn't been a barrier in the past. But we'll see moving forward in the future, will this be a barrier to our work? And I, I hope not, but if it follows the patterns around the country, I know it will be, but I have relationships with people and hopefully we can sit down and we can work things out because Virginia, I mean, <laughs> Virginia lacks choice, you know, mm -hmm. read, read into that what you want. Uh, let me rephrase that. Virginia lacks choice for poor black and brown. Right. Family. There are plenty of schools for, Middle class and for white for white families and middle class upper class black families with our magnet schools and charter schools and governor schools, but for poor black and brown families, there's not a lot of choice in the state. Of Rodney, state. that's a theme that comes up very often um, on this platform about the lack of choice and the lack of resources. If you are poor, if you are brown, and if you are black, um, you just don't have the choice. You don't have the luxury of saying my school, my kid's school sucks or my kid's school is a representative of my child, I'm just going to go to the next school, or I'm going to get money to go to a private school or a parochial school. Those choices just in reality do not exist for poor Black people. Um, and the fact that they have to take whatever is given to them, it's just yeah. a shame. Yeah. It is a shame. I spoke with a friend, with a parent who is, you know, from Philly, who just moved down from Philly some years ago. Yep. And she was like, where's the choice? Where, where's the opportunities? And I was like, Welcome to Virginia. You know, <laughs> yes. I hate to say that, but but at the same time, we're having conversations with a lot of legislators and people. They they're starting to understand. That's one thing about coming out of the pandemic is that we're gonna get more choice for Black and Brown families because Dope. we know that they're the backbone of this party in Virginia. That's so right. we're gonna hold them accountable. Yes, definitely. Um, I also think it's good to hear, I mean, you yourself are a black male educator and you hear from other black male educators. What in your teaching um, experience or what things are black men experiencing inside of schools that are basically uh, making them run for the hills after they get into education? Um, a lot of it is... <sighs> a lot of it <laughs> is the lack of respect. 
And with mm-hmm. that lack of respect, there's a number of things within that. There's just the, hey, you deal with the black and brown kids. Mm-hmm. We're going to send them all to you every day. You handle all their problems and report back to us. That's number one. That's burn them out. Mm-hmm. But also there's the lack of opportunity and respect from other teachers. Mm-hmm. You know, when I talk to the guys in RVA Men Teach, one of the things they say is sometimes I don't even want to say something in my faculty meetings because I know it's going to get taken the wrong way and out of context. Mm. So one thing we have to do is we have to create safe spaces for our, our male educators of color who, who want to speak up, who want to disagree with the dominant group in our profession, who want to hold them accountable for some of the harmful practices that they are, that they see every day in class. You know, and so it's easy when you're handling all the problems, but when you start to speak up, wait a minute, the kids aren't the problem in the system. There are other people and other things yes. in our system that are causing the problems with our kids. No, yes. we don't want to hear from that guy. You know, nope. We want you to just handle this problem and just let us go on pretending everything is great within our classrooms, within our systems. That's and right. so we want to create a space where we can speak up, but we can hold these other teachers accountable That's for right. the outcomes of our Black students. Yes, you can't just put, them, put yeah. that on the black teacher. You have to say, "Hey, wait a minute!" You know he can't read because you're not teaching proper literacy skills. You know, yep. not because he's poor, not because he's black. There are other things at play, and we need to start holding this entire system accountable. And That's you're right. Fighting that every single day is like banging your head up against the wall, and it wears exactly. our guys out. And exactly. so they just. They're just out, you know. I was speaking to not in my district, a brother in another district, and he was just saying, you know, he got a job as a math specialist, you know, and he was sitting there trying to get the teachers to try some new practices, do some different things for our kids. You know, he's like, I've been doing this all year, banging my head up against this wall. In comes a, a white professional who says the exact same thing he said, and then all of a sudden, the school's like oh, we have a, a math problem. Let's start addressing it using these strategies that this guy suggested, even though those are the same strategies that brother has talked about all year. And so mm-hmm. that's what they're banging their head against. That's what's driving them out. It's just the frustration. Anybody who's not respected is going to be out. And, and that's, what, that's what we're dealing with. And what's super sad, a, a connection I just drew in my head about what you said is like the invisibility, right? of the black man in the settings, but that, that same thing is replicated to our children, our, our black boys in education, right? The invisibility of the black boy in the classroom. So as soon as you said that, like another person came in, it's like, so I'm invisible, right? But our black boys are having the same experience um, in these classrooms in our education system. So I would love to hear from you. Um, I ask my guests this often too. Why are black teachers so important for black children? You can't be what you can't see. That's right. You know? And there's so much in life of what they're told they are, what they told they can, what they, there's limits put on who they think they can be. And mm-hmm. so what black teachers do is they say, wait a minute, this is my child. This child looks like me. I can relate to his family. I can relate to his culture. I can relate to his upbringing. And so everything about this kid is representative of me. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to push that kid to be the best. I'm going to push that kid to to do that extra. You know, it's funny because growing up in King Run, Virginia, I remember I had two element black elementary school teachers, two black females, and you know all about Dr. Lindsay's study about black children, thirty nine percent more likely, you know, to graduate if they have black mm-hmm. teachers, but I didn't need that study. I saw it with my classmates growing up. All those kids that had Dr. Hall, Dr. Hall and his brothers in elementary schools, we all graduated. We all went to college. Whereas the other black students who didn't have them struggled in life. Some of them struggled in middle school, some of them struggled in high schools. And so that's what it means. It means you can be whatever. You can't see what you can't be. And I remember I was having a conversation with um, Anthony Corey Gonzalez. He's a Ohio Teacher of the Year 2021. And he was telling me a story about his students. He teaches at a school for the deaf. 
And he was saying some of his students thought that when they got older, they would be able to hear because all of their teachers could hear. Mm. That, that like floored me, but then I thought about it to black kids. How many black kids say, wait a minute, I don't see any black teachers in my school or in my community. Education is not the profession for me because I don't see anybody who looks like me. I don't see that mirror in front of me in the classroom. And so mm -hmm. subconsciously we're telling our kids, hey, you don't, you can't be an educator, you know? And then another personal experience, yeah. Growing up, I was a math whiz. Math was my favorite subject. You know, I could sit down, I could do any math problem. I could knock it out like that. But I remember I had two experiences. One, when I got into 12th grade, I had a professor tell me not to take AP Calculus. You know? And she said, Why? oh, don't do this. We got this other course we want you to take. Me, mm -hmm. I know nothing about the process. I'm thinking, okay, I'll take this other course. But then I'm tutoring and helping the kids who are in AP Calculus. AP Calculus. Because they're my Insane. friends. Insane. But I, I remember I never saw a math person who looked like me. And so mm. math was never something I said I wanted to do because I was basically told that math isn't for black boys growing up. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of my biggest regrets was that I never pursued my passion for numbers because I never saw anybody that looked like me. Thank you. And so that, that's what it means. When, when we have Black teachers, we, we don't put limitations on what our Black boys and Black girls can be. That's right. We change the narrative by creating pipelines to create more Black teachers and have them in. Um, excellent points. I think the other great work that you're doing um, that's really important to build in this pipeline is training leaders and recruiting leaders. We all know even when we talk about retention, I hear this a lot. People don't necessarily leave schools, they leave leaders. And what happens a lot of times is you have leaders who are not equipped. Like we talk a lot about culturally competent pedagogy, but we, we also need to start having a conversation about culturally competent leadership um, and people in schools that need to know how to support and handle black teachers, how to create communities and environments where black teachers feel safe and they feel hurt um, and they feel valued. So that's also, I feel like some excellent work that you're doing. Um, that's really connecting the pieces of the pipeline. I think a lot of times we have these efforts where people are working on a very specific piece of the pipeline. So like we'll recruit black males, but then we'll put black males into situations where they're dealing with racist leaders. And then boom, all that recruitment effort we didn't put into then went <laughs> on out the window, right? So we didn't spend two years recruiting you, grooming you, doing all this. You didn't got an education. It's like, nah, I don't, you know what? This situation ain't for me because we're putting you in a hostile environment. So I think that the work that you're doing to really groom, create, and train leaders um, is dope. So shout out to y'all for that. Um, you, can you tell us about some of the tactics or strategies you guys are using to uh, basically train culturally competent leaders? Like how can they support their Black teachers? Ronnie, are you on mute? Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry about that. But um, okay. one thing we're doing is we're making sure that all our leaders are aware of the issues in that building. You know, I often tell people, you know, when I when I go around and talk that that mirror is the biggest tool for, for educational improvement. You got to look in that mirror every day. and You got to ask yourself some tough questions. And mm -hmm. we have some leaders who ain't who not quite looking in that mirror and asking questions. Mm -hmm. So we're going to I'm going to ask you those questions. Mm -hmm. What are you doing in your schools to not support your teachers of color? You know, mm -hmm. we're working on studying the data where are the schools in our district where we're not supporting teachers of color. Where are the schools in our district that are struggling to retain everyone? And so we're really putting effort into that. We're using leveraging our partnerships. Uh, a lot of our guys, I think we have 30 guys in a mentorship program with Virginia State University. No, hmm. Shout out my HBCU, Virginia State. But hmm. what they're doing at Virginia State is they're learning culturally competent mentorship. Hmm. You know, that's learn how do we how do we support black males, teachers, and black teachers when they come into the profession? And then we're also working with leadership. How do we support culturally competent leadership? And so from that group, we're developing male mentor teachers. We're developing male mentor um, um, principals. And we're just going to create a network, creating that community where 
you will support it. And the one thing I love about this program is the second we announced this program, so many dope principals and leaders in my district hit me up immediately. Let's go. Let's do this. This is needed. Let's get this work done. Let me know what I can do. What can my school do? They've offered internships to teachers who want to be leaders. They've all gone out of their way to make sure that they're supported at every aspect of their leadership. To the point we even have school counselors who come in and say, look, man, we can't talk about getting more male teachers without talking about getting more male school counselors. You know, so we're talking about how do we increase the number of male school counselors to help our children. So it's really about building that community and having those solid conversations and sitting people down to having those tough conversations. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes people don't like to hear what you have to say, but I often say, look, nothing I say to you is personal. Everything I say is professional and everything I say is for the best interest of students and teachers. Children, that's right. If you can't can't understand that, then we're gonna have a problem communicating. So it's not personal. (laughs) It's not personal. Don't take it. So personal. I say that often, but I, I think that the extra piece I need to add on that is if you don't understand that we're going to have a problem communicating, <laughs> but I am with you. The decisions I'm making, the feedback I'm giving is always going to be in the best interest of the children we serve because yes. uh, we are of service to our children and our families. So I agree with you wholeheartedly on that. I think another great thing is you're not somebody who just came in out the blue, was in the classroom for two years and then jumped into this role. You have 20 years yeah. <laughs> of experience, 20 years of teaching, like, which is amazing. And again, your work focused and dedicated on helping black and brown students and really trying to dismantle and disrupt the school to prison pipeline. I would love to hear about just some of your early experiences with teaching black children. And why was that really important for you to get in there and dismantle the school to prison pipeline? Well, it's, it's weird. When I first started teaching, I tell people, the reason I was successful is because when I started teaching, I had some of the strongest black male mentors in the district work with me. I, at the time, I didn't realize it. But mm. as time gone on in the profession, and I watched some of these people who mentored me go on to become principals, superintendents, state directors. And I'm like, wait a minute. I was in a very privileged position coming into the classroom to have this person looking out for me. And so they taught, I learned so many lessons, you know, just everything I learned from these great mentors and how to deal with parent, how to deal with community, how to set up your classroom and how to teach, you know, because one thing I was coming from rural, I'll come from rural Virginia, I was country boy. People always call me big country when I got to Richmond, you know what I mean? Hey, big country. country. And so I had to learn the urban environment. I had to learn the urban community. And that was not something I knew, you know, it was a little different, you know, something very simple. I'll give you an example. You know, when I started working at Armstrong High School, I remember every day coming into school, I would get so frustrated with my students because they would be walking in the center of the street. Kids walking down the middle of the road, you know, and I'm like, I'm trying to drive. I'm trying to get to school. You know, that's just what they did. They walked down the road. And so one day I just sat down and had a conversation with my kids like, why do you all walk in the middle of the street? It's so annoying. It's so dangerous. <laughs> you know? Then one of my students said, for real, Mr. Rob, our neighborhoods ain't safe. And when we walk on the sidewalk, we're cornering ourselves. Yes. If somebody want to jump out on us, then they already got us pinned. And so by walking in the middle of the street, that allows us to spread out in case yep. a, a dangerous situation arises. Yep. Keep that and so me as a person who grew up in rural Virginia, I had no idea. I just thought they were just being teenagers walking in the middle of the street just to be defiant teenagers. But no, this is a survival method based on their community and where they live. Mm -hmm. And so just that conversation let me know, look, man, you don't know anything. So Mm -hmm. start having these conversations. So I started having lunch clubs that, you know, where kids could come to lunch and we didn't talk academics at all. We just chopped it up. We started after school movie clubs because I would show them a clip in the classroom doing history. Then it's like, you want to see the whole movie? Stay back with me after school. And we stay back and watch the movies. I learned more about them. They learn more about me. And mm-hmm. that was just the beginning of building those relationships. And so and that's what it's all about, learning who your kids are, learning the community, and then providing what they need. And so I was I did that for what, 15 years of my career. 
But then, mm -hmm. you know, typical black male, that burnout started to come. You know, mm -hmm. I was just tired. I'm working every day to seven, eight o'clock some nights. Mm -hmm. I was just tired. And so I decided I'm going to try something different. And my principal, well, you know, she's my friend then, but she was called me. She's like, look, I got to open it for a history teacher at the juvenile detention center. You know, I was mm -hmm. like, hmm. she's like, you know anybody? I was like, well, let me think. She's like, no, let me cut it. I, I need you down here. You know, I know <laughs> you. I know how you work with our kids. And so I'll be honest, some of those same kids you teach up there are the kids that are here right now. Mm -hmm. And so she said, she told, invited me down. I thought about it because I'm claustrophobic. I don't like the idea of prison. Just, oh, yeah. Uh, but then Virginia dropped 2015. That's when they dropped their first U.S. Department of Education, dropped their first comprehensive study on the school to prison pipeline. Ah, and okay. Virginia, number one state in referring students to juvenile justice. Mm. So, you know, some, I believe in the calling. And sometimes you get these signs. Somebody's like, hey, man, pay attention. This is your sign that you need yes. to go down here and learn. Yes. You know, I can read books, but I'm going to go and talk to my students. What is going on? Why are you, get, why are you getting locked up? And I remember the first day at the jail, I had three students who I had just failed at the high school. Oh no! First class walked in. That wow. was a, that was a reality. Go. I was just think was like the, the reality of that hitting you. Yeah, was and I, I, I was just too, like, wow. That was a punch in the face. Like, hey mm. man, what are you doing? You're doing something wrong. You failed these kids. Yes. They right here, locked up. Oh. And so that was that moment where I got to change everything from my grading system to attendance to pedagogy. I need to be better because I failed these kids. The system didn't fail these kids. And then when I taught the kids down to jail, I actually got to know them better. It's like, these kids are geniuses. Yeah. You know, this system is so messed up. And then I was learning more about the actual system and how... I mean, it's designed to chop us up. You know, sometimes you say, man, this system is intentionally designed to take out black men. But when you get into that system and actually see the policies and everything that take place, yes. like, wow, this is this is genius level the way they designed the system to chop yes. up. Because it is very intentional. Men. It's very intentional. Yes. It's very pointed. It's very calculated. It is, yes. And when like, people I, talk I, about I, industrial slavery and in the and all of that, like it's a it's a real thing. Just give you a quick framework of the Virginia system. Virginia mm -hmm. has a point system for juvenile, and so when you do, look, whenever you commit infractions, you get points. You okay. know, and these points build up, build up. So little things, missing curfew, you know, not attending school, mm -hmm. a minor assault charge that you probably got from a school resource officer. You mm -hmm. know, these sort of things they build up. So the whole time you're 13, 14, 15, committing these acts, it's, it's smack on your hand. Yep. Smack on your hand. But then when you get 16, 17, when you're old enough to be tried as an adult and you go to you go to trial for that minor assault charge or that marijuana charge, the judge is going to bring out that stack of everything you did from when you were a child making 16, bad decisions. And now they're, they're going to give you that probationary program, that six month program to get your life together. You know, but they're not going to give you the supports you need outside of school to help you get out of that life. They're just going to say, hey, you got six months to get it together. Then they release you back into to the to your neighborhoods. So now you're, you're 17. You commit one more act. Not only are we charging you with this, but we're going to back up everything else you did since you were 13 years old. So now we got seven, eight years over your head. You know, so when you come out, you're 23, 24 years old. You have felonies on your record. Mm -hmm. And so that system just chews our young men up. And so one of the first things I did was I got to teach my <laughs> teach these kids about the system. That's you know, right. I went to Yale as part of their teacher's institute. And I worked with James Foreman, you know, who wrote the Pulitzer Prize book when yeah. they were locking up our own. And so mm -hmm. I just developed a whole curriculum unit on the system, Good. understanding jail, understanding probation, understanding the system and how you can advocate for yourself. Because yes. let's be honest, most of them have public defenders. And like I said, if you think teachers overwork, you should see public defenders. And, you know? and they caseloads, right? 30, 40 people, kids <laughs> on their on case loads, they got to defend. They and day out with exactly. no... 
no time to prep, no time to research, nothing. So, and again, got, like you said, the system designed to keep them down. Yep. And I got my kids questioning their public defender saying, wait a minute, what about this? What about that? You know, this was an illegal search, you know, so, you know, yes, I'm yes, I want you to understand Keep that you have rights within the system. And so my kids, you know, they're starting to beat some of their charges. They're starting to get second chances because yeah. they know about the system. You know, yes. and then the thing about the system that's most disheartening that people don't know is that white kids in the city of Richmond are arrested just as much as black kids. Mm. But we never see the white kids at the juvenile detention center. And then that begs the, the question, right? Like, well, why yeah. is that? Right? Because they're not they're not poor. <laughs> yeah. They're not black, they're not brown. Even, even some of them are poor, but we, we don't see them there. You know, it, it's just a system designed. And so I tell the kids the best way you can defeat the system is you learn as much about it as possible. You gotta play on you gotta you gotta play them away games. You're you're yeah. that's my old football coach talking. Sometimes <laughs> you gotta go on their field and learn their rules and play their game. You gotta right. play them away games because mm -hmm. that's what's gonna get you out of the system, that's what's gonna get you an opportunity. And that's what we've been talking about, advocating, meeting with the mayor. You know, one thing we would have with our kids, we would have um we had meetings and we call you can't say nothing. You got to come here, sit in front of these kids, and you got to listen to them for 45 minutes to an hour before you can say anything. Dope. And that's that's the most effective thing, because we know how politicians are. They yeah. got the quick comeback. They got the flat. No, the rules of this say you can't say anything. You have to listen to our kids. And from those programs, we got more after school funding, more, you know, parks and rec, just different programming designed to help our kids. And so that's what I'm talking about when I say we got to break the school to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? We listen to the kids that are in it and talk, yeah. let them tell their stories and talk about what is necessary to keep me from making the same mistakes that I've made in life. Because I don't care. I'm so tired of these people coming in with all these degrees and PhDs saying, oh, this works, this works, this works. No, sit the kids down and say, hey, what works? What, what do, do you need to, do to keep you out of here? And that's start right. doing that. Yes, and I think a major part of your work is educating those kids. I think that was super important, educating them on their rights and the design of the system um, so that they understand how to beat it. But I mean, all of this amazing work that you were doing um, in the classroom and then leading into juvenile justice is dope. Um, and I, you know, we know the gravity of your work led you to be named the, two, the, the 2019 National Teacher of the Year. How did it feel to receive that honor? It was humbling. Mm. Very, very humbling to get this honor because, number one, I was only the third black male to ever win this honor. Shout out to Thomas Fleming and James Rogers. You know, I often say I stand on the shoulders of giants. I stand on their shoulders. They were the first two black males to win this honor. And so when I won it, it was just, it was almost like I didn't believe it at first. Like, because I don't do this. We don't do this work for the for awards. We do this work for, 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 for the success of our, our communities. That's right. And so it was weird because at first I suffered from imposter syndrome. I'm like, National Teacher of the Year? This ain't me. But then I sat down with my principal, who I've known for 20 years. We worked together since we were new teachers. And she started talking about all the stuff and the memories and the things we've done over the years that you're more deserving of this award than anything. Anybody, more yeah. Really, our kids are deserving of this award. Those mm -hmm. kids who are out there, you know, who are locked up trying to get an education, they don't get a voice. So your job as National Teacher of the Year is to be their voice, to go out, talk about the things that they that they go through, the things that they see and how education isn't necessarily a great thing for them. It's more of a tool of trauma. And so mm -hmm. that really put me in a better headspace to deal with it. But it was just also just, just, I mean, I mean, I like to spot off at the mouth. Let's be honest. <laughs> I say I feel, you know, but it's different as a classroom teacher because no one listens. But now all of a sudden, mm -hmm. that people are putting microphones in, in your face. And so when you say something, it's like, whoa, they heard that. Okay. <laughs> so now yes. I'm careful of what I say because I don't want anything to detract from my students. I don't want yeah. anything to detract from what's going on. And then on top of it, it's just being a black man. I mean, mm -hmm. the country ain't ready for that. You know, the country, 
So that, that was my next question. I think mean, uh, this is an important conversation for all to hear. So my folks out there listening, make sure you are liking, make sure you are sharing this conversation. But that was my next thing. Like, I think, yes, it's an honor. It feels good. It's humbling. And it's also good to know, like, you won this, not just for you, but for all those kids that you told, like, this is this for the culture, right? As they say, yeah. this is for the community. Yeah. But what also came with that might have been some struggles. What are some of the struggles you face? Because like you said, we know America ain't ready for a black man to be in charge, okay? Yeah. And receive his accolades or be calling <laughs> him an expert in the field that's dominated by white women, right? Now we got a black man yeah. as a national teacher of the year. So what were some struggles that came with that role? Well, th there was immediate struggles because you know, when, you, when you're working in a field where you're not the dominant voice, people don't understand how things affect you differently. I remember I was sitting down with a couple of the um, um, representatives from CCSSO and the whole issue of the White House came up. They never gotten a confirmation date from the White House. And so we were sitting there, we were having lunch and it was like, they were super excited. We got a date for the White House. We're going to go to the White House. But here's the thing. Number one, you're not technically going to the White House. You're going to a ceremony on the White House grounds. Mm. And number two, you're not going to get an award from the president. You're going to get it from somebody else. And I'm like, mm. what? So let me get this straight. I'm not going to get an opportunity to go in the Oval Office like the other teachers of the year before me. Then on top of that, I'm not even going to get a chance to get my award handed to me by the president of the United States. How mm. do I deal with that as a black male from, from the media point of view? And he was like, what do you mean? I was silent just like this. But you, you don't <laughs> understand what I mean when I say that? And so that was a moment that let me know this is going to be a long, long year because they don't understand the position that I'm in right now. Mm -hmm. And so I was just like, man, this is going to be hard. But at the same time, I said, you know what? I want this. First of all, my ancestors built that house. There's been 40-some people hey. in the house. But my ancestors built it and their architecture still stands. So it's I'm going to go okay. and I'm going to get my position. That's I'm right. going to, you know, force the president to shake my hand because this is something that's been afforded everybody else. Why are you going to deny this to me? That's you know, right. so when we're in that picture, you're going to see that picture. Everybody's smiling. Uh, but to me, it's a smile like, yeah, I know you don't want to do this. You know, but I was told that you weren't going to do this. And I know right. that there's somebody in your ear making you do this. But more importantly, it was like, I'm here. I'm representing the kids of Richmond, Virginia, these kids that have been locked up, these kids that have been locked, not given the opportunities. This is our moment, and you're not going to take this from me. But That's then crazy. there's just the, the tons of other stuff that go along with that. I was the first national teacher of the year recently to not get an international trip. You know, mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't go overseas. I was the first to have other state teachers of the year lead a protest during Washington week. You know, they led a protest, used my name to plan the protest, but, <laughs> you know, planned the protest. Luckily, most of them backed off once we had a conversation, but there were still some who went through it. And I don't hold any ill will toward it, but it's also like, you don't want me as a black man. You don't think I can represent your interest and your very thing? reminiscent of the black male experience in education. <laughs> you are still invisible. Like I am a token out here. Exactly. And so then there was just the constant travel, the disrespect. I mean, there were times there were literally times when I had to put people out of, of, of rooms because they were being disrespectful, they were not listening, they were I mean, you just constantly run into that. Then just the travel, being a black man traveling in America constantly, mm -hmm. those microaggressions you sit from can't catch a cab to Ubers driving right by you. You know, mm. sitting outside of hotels and people just walking up, dropping bags in front of you like your bellboy. Those those things wear on me, you know. Yeah. But at the same time, I often think, look, if my students can get up, face the things that they face every single day and still show up to school with that, you know, wanting to learn to try to be better. This is only a minor inconvenience for me compared to what they go through every single day. Yes. And so a lot of times whenever something would happen while I was traveling or when somebody would write some horrible piece about me or somebody, a politician would say something terrible about me, 
I always went back to the strong, my, my old high school that I taught at for years and to that community because East End and Richmond got my back. I tell those people hey. all the time, you know, they, they got my back. They're going to support me. They're going to keep it real. I'm I'm not Rodney Robinson, National Teacher of the Year. I'm Big Rock. You, you big touch me, okay? Exactly. <laughs> and so when I go back there, they keep me grounded, you know, and they kept me motivated. They were the ones who said, look, man, keep doing what you're doing. You know, you always got a home here. We got your back. And so no, just ignore the BS that's out there. Ignore that hate. Ignore the hate mail, the death threats, all that stuff that com comes with you just speaking your mind and speaking your truth. And so I'm forever grateful. I'll tell people that I'm forever grateful to the East End, Richmond, Virginia, because they held me down. And they, I don't think they truly know how much they held me down throughout that year and kept me supported when I felt like the world was caving in on me. So I truly want to shout them out. Yeah, shout out to Virginia for having big country back. You know what I mean? He out here. Y'all y'all didn't raise this brother, okay? <laughs> y'all didn't raise this brother to be right and be a freedom fighter. But with that, we're shouting out VA. I want to pause real quick and get into uh, a segment that that's new uh, to our co-conspirators out there called Think a Black Teacher. Um, I think it's super important that we begin to, in every episode, lift up the people who have really influenced our lives or the people who are out there influencing other people's lives. Mm -hmm. So I would love to get into our segment of Think a Black Teacher, Rodney and I. Yes. So, Rodney, I'm going to give you the floor right now to thank a black teacher. And I'm going to invite all our people out there watching, all our co-conspirators um, and new supporters in the chat. Please write the name of a black teacher that you want to thank, but then hashtag it with thank a black teacher. Rodney, I'm going to give you the floor right now. Uh, thank a black teacher. That, now, if anybody of you read or know my story, you know, I always shout out Mr. Sorrell, my band teacher. He was the only black male teacher I had you know, in K through 12. But I want to give a shout out to a different teacher. And that's Miss Dorothy Coker, my 11th grade English teacher. And what happened was I was in honors English, in the honors program, ninth, 10th grade, and I struggled. I had, you know, teachers who didn't look like me and they, they just really knocked down my confidence. You know, I read stories of people who weren't like me. I got you know, all kinds of just negative images of what I can be. And I remember specifically in 10th grade, I had a teacher, we, we were doing a poetry lesson. I wrote a poem and she threw my poem in the car, in the garbage and called it trash. Why? Yeah. And so that's when I said, I got to get out of this honors program. And so when I left the honors program, I got put in Ms. Ms. Coker's class. And Ms. Coker's class, we read... Baldwin. We read the autobiography of Malcolm X. We read all kinds of literature of people who looked like me. But more importantly, she built my confidence. She told me my writing wasn't trash. She the one who gave me an opportunity to express myself in class and not be punished for it. And so I'm forever thankful to her because she truly, truly saved me. Because without literacy, without that grandma, you go nowhere in life. Mm -hmm. And she was the one who helped repair me. She took that broken kid who thought his writing and his English skills were trash and said, no, it's not trash. It just hasn't been appreciated. It hasn't been uplifted yet. And so I want to thank Ms. Coker because I really had forgot about her. You know, that experience was so traumatic. I truly had forgot about it until one day last year, I was having a conversation with another classmate and they brought up Miss Coker and I just, I forgot about Miss Coker. But it wasn't that I forgot about her. It was just that experience I had, I had gone through was traumatic and I blocked it out my mind. But then I'm forever thankful for her for, for repairing me. You know, when the system beat me down and told me I was nothing, she was that black teacher who said, no, you, you are king, you are whatever you want to be, you're going to go off to school and you're going to be a professor one day. And I remember her telling me that. And I, that was just, thank you, Ms. Coker, because you made a difference in my life. And I don't think you'll ever understand what you did. I might not even be here today if it wasn't for you. Ronnie, that's awesome. So please, folks out there, 
hashtag think a black teacher and name that black teacher in the comments. Um, and I, oh, I want to lift up um, Brooke B and Daniel Moneyham, who were some of my very early guests when we started this show, who introduced that hashtag on this show. So shout out to them. We're going to keep that movement going. So think a black teacher. Again, you got to give people flowers while they're here. And then when you realize an adult impact, the impact people made on your life, let them know that. Mm -hmm. So name your black teacher in the comments and please uh, hashtag think a black teacher. Um, one more thing I want to get into, Rodney, because we are winding down on time. I think it would be great to hear from you. What will it take for us just as a people to achieve educational justice? Ooh, boy. <laughs> right? Educate. It starts with educational reparations. Mm -hmm. You know? People say, oh, you can't quantify reparations. Yo, yes, you can. Yes, you can. <laughs> Start with education. Start with the fact that schools with students of color receive $23 billion less funding. That's number mm. one. Let's make sure that we're giving you know, those schools the money they need to be successful. Number two, we need to repair and replace the Black educational capital that was destroyed in Brown versus Board of Education. You know, far too often we talk about Brown. Everybody wants to talk about the great part of Brown. Oh, integration, integration. But number one, Brown was about funding more so than it was about integration. So let's re re reimagine that. But also, we need to repair that sixty to seventy thousand black male te black teachers, administrators, counselors who were fired. You know, and so it's so so important that we do that because people say, you know, why why don't black kids like school? It's like, no, when did school stop liking black kids? And that can be traced back immediately to Brown versus Board of Education. And so we need to start repairing that. We need to start investing in Teacher for Tomorrow programs to start recruiting black teachers at, when they're in middle and high school. We need to provide scholarships, not loan forgiveness that, you know, Betsy DeVos and her people would never give us. We need to be of scholarships for those who want to go into education. We need to give incentives for teachers that are doing well. We need to empower them to be leaders and train up the next generation because that's what's important. So we need to repair that Black educational capital. We need to fund the schools. And we need to just independence. We need the ability yeah. to just do what works for our kids. We know the numbers. We know all the surveys. And we know the power of having teachers who look like the students in the classroom but we're not making that investment necessary to do that. So let's do that. And then on top of that, let's give them the independence to work. We know the system as it's built. Let's be honest, our system was built for, for white women. Yes. Our educational system. So yes. let's, wait a minute, let's have allow people to build systems that work for their community, that work for their neighborhoods. We talk about neighborhood schools, but yet we don't want the neighborhood to control their school. Have you can any, have a neighborhood look, school as any long as the state tells you. Yes. You know, nah, Talk if you're a neighborhood it. school, then you should do what's good for your neighborhood. So we really need to get more of that independence to do what's necessary for our kids. Because numbers say that's what works. That's what works. And so we really need to have a conversation of, are we really doing... And what's, what's, the, what's the phrase, the database best practices? Database <laughs> best practices says have allowing teachers of color to work with students of color and giving them the freedom to do what's necessary is what helps those schools. So let's do that. That's database best practice. So fund us, restore and replace us, yes. and let us do our own thing. That's how we get educational justice. Leave us alone, child. Give us some money and leave us alone. <laughs> we got experts in our communities and our field who will train us up in the right way uh, to be able to be effective. But give us some money and leave us alone, child. Okay? <laughs> Good stuff. Well, we are winding down to a close. But, Ronnie, I also want to give you the floor one more time. This is there anything um, you want to close out with and say to our supporters and folks that have been watching today? Um, this work can't be done alone. That, and that's the key, you know, I want to shout out, um, you know, just the black male deans at the schools of education locally, Dr. Dare at Virginia Commonwealth University, Dr. Walter at Virginia State University, Dr. Seeley at Virginia Union University. 
they have been my sounding boards. They have been brothers that have supported the initiative for RVA Men Teach. They've supported initiatives where they're sending me their black male and brown male student teachers and education majors because they want to get them involved with the proper mentorship. And this really takes the entire community from, you know, everyone in the community saying, what can I do to be a teacher? How can you help me? Just everybody, because you can't get this done alone. You try to do this work by yourself, you will burn yourself out and you will not be successful. I just want to shout out Richmond community. I want to shout out Sharif. Sharif has been giving me advice, giving me guidelines, giving, you know, just letting me know what's the, what the deal is. And just every single person out there who wants to uplift and our communities and uplift our black and brown students because that work is hard. That work mm -hmm. is hard, but it's also the work that will, will, will just replenish yourself. You know, I often leave with the Tupac quote, it's like, why I got into education is like, I might not change the world, but I might spark the brain that will change the world. That's right. And so just come into education, support us, build your networks, and let's do this thing because our kids, our community, needs us that's right ronnie that was dope um it has been an honor to talk to you today brother you are a true example of what an education activist is you are out here in the community fighting for our people fighting for our children and using your platform for good this ain't about you personally you ain't on a personal quest for fame or none of that you are truly out here to serve the community and you are out here being a servant leader so shout out to you ronnie we appreciate you, you. And I thank you for coming on the show today. Like Anytime. super appreciative. Definitely I always tell guests. We'll be other conversations, other to other topics that I know you have an expertise in. So we'll probably definitely have you back. Thank you just for that. I can't tell you how many times this year people say, Oh, look, he teaches prison kids, alternative kids. That's it. I'm like, no. nah, I can teach your kids. Can you come teach mine? <laughs> you know, let's <laughs> have that can't. conversation. No. <laughs> so just the fact that you said that, that I'm an expert in other things. That's just so enlightening to hear because you don't hear that too often. Oh, oh, you are. And it's shame. And if people don't re realize that, all they got to do is Google your name um, and see the work that you've done, the spaces you've been in, the people you've talked to, but the work you've been able to get done. Right now, I feel like you're a master at partnerships. You're a master at capacity building. You're a master at getting in rooms that other people won't have access to the door. Right. So people need to hear from you about how to be that change agent in the community. You are definitely uh, somebody that I see has an expertise on multi-levels of building a pipeline to advocate for the community and get equitable education for our children. So, brother, don't let anybody tell you different. You are here doing your thing. You are here serving, brother. Okay? Yes. Well, everybody out there, I want to thank you once again for coming to watch the Building the Black Educator Pipeline. We'll see you again next week. Same place, same time. Peace, y'all.